Hello, this is Joe at Sierra Specialty Auto. Good to have you here in the shop. Uh, my wife has asked me to make an appearance in these videos. She doesn't want me to do the this old Tony thing and appear only as a pair of hands on the workbench. She wants to see my face somewhere in the video. Now, I'm a guy who picks his battles, and this is not a battle that I'm going to pick. So, hi honey, here I am. Hope this is acceptable to you. Uh, today I'm working on a project for a friend. Uh, this is a job that I used to do uh, before I retired uh, in, in my uh, business as Sierra Specialty Auto. Uh, I did this repair uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, you know, that's been several years and now, now I have a buddy who uh, has this problem that I used to take care of, so I told him I'd help him out. Uh, let me get you in a little closer to the workbench here and and we'll discuss uh, the problem and what I plan to do to fix it. These are parts for Dunlop caliper pods, uh, for instance from an early XKE 3.8 also used on a large number of other vehicles, mostly foreign, uh, mostly British. Uh, although this caliper was used on uh, Datsun Fairlady in the front and also on the original uh, Studebaker Avanti. I'll put up a picture here of a complete caliper for a few seconds. Uh, that's what they look like after they've been restored. Here is what we always refer to as a caliper pod. You can see there's a pin here in the middle. That pin goes into a hole in the caliper. This uh, right here uh, center hole uh, clears uh, that pin and there's a spring, a little tiny spring that goes in the larger hole here. A uh, larger hole is quarter inch uh, by about 360 deep and the smaller hole which may not show in this picture is uh, uh, roughly speaking eighth of an inch by one inch deep from this face and I'll put up a uh, 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 drawing. We'll uh, We'll go here to uh, Fusion 360 and uh, take a look at a, at a view of this. The end of that clearance hole for the pin right there at the cursor is only about 50 thousandths of an inch from the face of, of the plug. So we have to be pretty careful here. Uh, the problem with this pair of pistons uh, and I should uh, probably mention uh, this is part of the piston. Uh, it gets used with uh, a collar like this. Uh, and I, uh, I'm going to, th these come in different sizes. These particular ones are two and one eighth uh, diameter. Uh, they also come in a number of other sizes, including inch and a half. Uh, and this uh, plug here is a press fit into the bore in this collar that would go together like that. It gets assembled, the spring goes in here, a couple of little flathead screws hold this on, and the total uh, ends up looking like this. This is a later version of the same piston. This piston, which can be disassembled, into component pieces was used uh, early in production. Uh, then later they simplified production uh, with this uh, one piece piston, uh, one piece except for a crimped retainer plate to hold the spring in. Uh, but th this would look 
much like this one when it is completely assembled. And these pistons have on the top they have uh, a little collar. I'm trying to get that to so that it shows. Uh, there's a reduced diameter under that cap uh, and it registers with a plate that is bonded to the brake shoe or the brake pad I should say and uh, here I'll put up uh, a picture of a set of brake pads uh, where you can see uh, how this collar works. This uh, interlocks here and helps uh, keep everything in position, keep the pad in position in the caliper during operation. So the problem is that this feature is fragile and when people are taking these apart using screwdrivers and uh, vice grip pliers and similar tools, uh, Bubba tools as Mr. Pete calls them. The retaining collar gets broken off and these two pistons have that issue. The distance here at the uh, fr from this surface under my fingernail to the end of the of the uh, counterbore in here uh, is only about fifty thousandths of an inch so I can't just uh, drill uh, an eighth of an inch hole here and make a little fitting and glue it in there there's there's nothing uh, nothing in there to uh, uh, to hold it there's not enough surface area uh, to to connect anything to so I'm going to make out of some 360 brass uh, bar stock, uh, I'm going to make a, an insert. I'm going to center drill and tap, or excuse me, uh, center drill and bore uh, from this end down in, oh, at least a half an inch or so and glue in with Loctite 640's cylindrical assembly retaining compound. I'm going to glue in a stub of this dowel, brass dowel, uh, sufficient to leave room to re-machine and duplicate this feature on the end of the piston and after I have glued that in place I will machine the slot the, the, the groove and I will turn this around in the lathe and rebore this hole uh, deep enough to clear this pin doesn't have to be quite an inch deep uh, and I'll make it just deep enough to safely clear rather than uh, go on the full inch as on these originals. Uh, after this dowel is uh, glued in to the piston I'll use uh, a thin parting tool, uh, nickel systems uh, parting tool. I'd like to have the something like the thin bit set that Steve Summers accumulated in his uh, uh, toolbox that he bought recently. Uh, but I'll make do with what I have. Uh, this groove on the original is uh, about fifty thousandths of an inch. Uh, I have uh, sixty-three thousandths uh, parting tool and that that'll work fine. All it has to do is uh, leave an edge to capture the slot as the pad is installed into the caliper assembly. And that uh, I think covers pretty well what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. 
and now we'll go to the lathe and get to work. Here we are at the lathe. I'm going to set these up using a royal chuck stop. These come in a set from, I think, from 5 millimeter to 35 millimeter thick. Uh, this is the 30 millimeter. Uh, this is, these are a very handy tool. They have magnets to hold them in place. Clean off the chuck faces to make sure you got no debris in there. And these just slide on and stick to the chuck. And now you can set your workpiece flat against the chuck stop. And that holds it in line uh, and uh, keeps you from having any run out. It's an extremely handy tool. They're, uh, they're a bit pricey, uh, but uh, I've got my money's worth out of my set. They are very convenient. We'll start by facing off what's left of this little nub. Uh, center drilling. Then I'll drill about a half an inch deep to 23 64ths. And then uh, ream to three eighths. Set the reamer in here. A little bit of oil. And take that in as far as it'll go. Clean off that oil with a bit of brake clean. One down. Rinse and repeat, as Tom Lipton would say.
That takes care of the prep on the pistons. Get the check stop out. We want a snug slit fit for this. We need a glue line and we've already got a snug slit fit. We need a glue line so we'll just be uh, doing a little bit of chamfer and uh, uh, clean the patina off of the brass. We will we will cut these bits of dowel to a length of 550 plus 100 and plus 100 plus uh, another 50 or so for good measure. Uh, let's make it 3 fourths of an inch. We can always face off what we don't need. and chamfer on the other end. I put a little bit more of a chamfer. This is the end that goes into the piston. We'll try to match the uh, the chamfer on the uh, end of that reamer where it dressed the bottom of the hole. Won't be a perfect match, but we'll get somewhere in the ballpark. contact area between the dowel and the piston. Let's see what that looks like. That leaves plenty for uh, machining and facing as uh, as Keith Fenner says, it's always better to be looking at it than looking for it.
right, that completes the rough out. Uh, got both of the dowels machined and ready to glue into the pistons. Uh, we'll, we'll take this set up down and uh, uh, move to another location to uh, complete uh, gluing the dowels into the pistons uh, to get them ready for the uh, finished machining. This is my gluing station. I have some of that Loctite 540 in a smaller container for ease of handling. I've carefully rinsed these parts uh, in with acetone to remove any oil uh, from fingerprints or uh, uh, residue from the honing, or excuse me, from the reaming. Uh, and just as we do uh, when we're making a uh, soldering a copper pipe joint, uh, we flux both sides of the assembly, the male and female. Uh, I use the adhesive on both sides of the assembly. Uh, and since these parts are copper alloys, they contain copper ions, uh, which is the kicker uh, that's sometimes sold for use with Loctite. The uh, isocyanurate adhesives will kick off faster if you prime the surface with a solution of copper ions and that exact product is one of the uh, accelerators that are available for use with the Loctite products. So, so we have our kicker built in here that gives us a shorter uh, operating time, a shorter window of opportunity for getting these assemblies completed. So I'm going to do one at a time because I'm afraid if I prepped uh, both sets of parts with the adhesive, uh, I might run out of time. I might not get that second uh, dowel all the way down in the hole before the adhesive got enough of a bite to keep it from going all the way. So I'll be moving quickly and doing one at a time. A little bit of adhesive in the hole. Spread that around with a wooden dowel. Grab just the end of the brass dowel. Add a little adhesive and spread that. I'm not going to worry about spreading it all the way up. It'll carry very well as I put this in with a screwing motion all the way to the bottom. A little pressure. Set that aside. Repeat on the other one. A bit of adhesive in the hole. Spread with a wooden dowel, grab the end, spread again over most of that contact surface with a wooden dowel, and screw it in to be sure of a uniform distribution of adhesive between both parts. I want full glue contact on that entire mating area because this has to hold uh, potentially as much as 1200 pounds per square inch of hydraulic fluid pressure. This will set up sufficiently within a couple of minutes while I'm putting things away here. Uh, it'll set up sufficiently to be able to move into my, uh, my gluing sink and use a toothbrush wetted with acetone to clean off the, the excess adhesive around the glue line. So I'll pivot up here and move in a little bit. I, it's hard for me to tell what kind of a view you're going to get. Uh, we'll, we'll hope that works all right. I'm just going to take an old 
toothbrush, wet it, and rub around gently to get the bulk of the excess adhesive off of there. Uh, I can finish uh, removing any excess, uh, any remaining uh, uh, color from the green adhesive uh, in the bead blaster uh, when I'm done. After the machining is done, I will uh, uh, give these a, a, a final finish by uh, bead blasting them with uh, glass beads. I'm not concerned at this time with the excess adhesive uh, down in this hole. Uh, we'll be drilling that out anyway uh, in the final machining, <coughs> machining process. So uh, that, that can, uh, can remain uh, without being disturbed uh, while these cure. And these develop maximum strength. These, uh, this adhesive develops maximum strength uh, in 24 hours. It's pretty good after, uh, actually after just a few minutes. I would not even begin to be able to remove these by hand uh, by trying to twist and pull on that even with pliers. Uh, within an hour it might be 90% uh, and in 24 hours it will have the remainder uh, of its strength. Uh, and it is uh, good when cured uh, with a, a proper glue line, which we have here, uh, to in the neighborhood of 4,000 pounds per square inch, which generally speaking means you either have to use heat to break the adhesive down, uh, or in an assembly like this you'd have to destroy it. You wouldn't possibly be able to get enough pressure on a, a, a pusher tool in here uh, to, to break that bond and push that that dowel out. Uh, that thing is stuck. It's, it's already stuck uh, and it'll be even better stuck uh, by morning when we come back to do the finished machining on, on this project. So we'll shut that down for now and pick this back up uh, in the morning after this, uh, this adhesive has fully, had time to fully cure. Alright, it's the next day hasn't been quite 24 hours, but it's certainly long enough for us to go ahead with the machining. The critical thing is that no pressure gets applied for a minimum of 24 hours, and this will certainly be the case for uh, this project. It'll be days, if not weeks, before these are assembled into the caliper pods. So I ended up with this particular one uh, almost exactly a hundred thousandths too long. Uh, this dimension uh, total height is not terribly critical. I'd say within five thousandths or so is plenty. So I'm going to touch off and set the DRO and we'll take a hundred thousandths off of this one and then I put the other one in and take a hundred thousand or uh, uh, go back to the same mark on the DRO so we get that one to the same length.
there's one, <clears throat> one down. The overall length is the most critical uh, dimension on this, followed closely by the thickness of this button that we leave. Uh, so I want to make that, be sure to make that uh, right at 50 thousandths to match the original. Uh, then the, the groove will go well, where it likes it, it uh, the depth of the groove is is not critical. So that's very close there. Let's set a zero on that. Bring it in fifty. That's pretty close. Let's lock that down uh, and. The cutter being, the parting tool being a little bit too wide is going to take a little bit off of this face right here, uh, right here, but I'm not concerned about that. That's, that is uh, one of the least critical dimensions uh, we have going here. I'm going to run this in until I match the 3 8 diameter uh, and then set a zero. Uh, and uh, uh, check against our uh, diameter for the neck of that collar for the reduced diameter. And we'll set zero on the X there. Yesterday I had noted that when this uh, plate is seated there's about a sixteenth of an inch of free play. I just checked that with a scale measure by eye. Uh, so I'll measure this dimension across the opening and subtract about a sixteenth of an inch and we'll use that for our final depth. We have here about 250 thousandths so I'll go to uh, uh, three sixteenths, 187 and a half. 187 and a half off of uh, 3 eighths is going to be 187 and a half. Since I'm doing math in my head, which is not always the best idea, I'm going to do a double check here, just a quick sanity check and 
make sure this looks like it's uh, doing what we want. Uh, that's clear, but not clear nearly enough. We definitely need that additional. That's pretty good. One more sanity check before we take it out. That looks just like what I had on the original. So, pop number two out, put number one back in. Repeat. two down. I'm going to take these to the bead blaster, polish them up, then I'll come back and chuck on this diameter uh, and uh, give this a quick hit with some fine uh, abrasive cloth just to touch up that surface. Uh, this is the surface that will be uh, running against the bore of the caliper when it's reassembled. So let's uh, take this set up down and uh, go to the bead blaster. Well this will be an interesting experiment. Let's see if I can shoot video through the lens into the bead blaster. Never tried this before. I have no idea how interesting this is going to be to watch. But it's interesting to do as a, as a video experiment. Okay, here we are back at the lathe. We have a length of pin that measures right at 15 sixteenths. Uh, I have another one of these I measured at just a hair more than 15 sixteenths. But we do gain the thickness of this retainer plate, which is a bit over a 32nd of an inch. That goes in first and holds the piston off the bottom by its thickness. 
so that means I think from the base of the piston uh, to the, uh, uh, the bottom of the hole, I, I think 15 sixteenths is a very safe number. Uh, the originals are uh, an inch deep. I don't, I don't think that's a, a, a number that we have to worry about too much. Consider also that uh, when these are put on the car uh, and the pads are installed, the only time that plate and the piston it's attached to will be all the way to the bottom of the bore is at, at, right after assembly. If the, uh, the piston gets pushed all the way in, gets put on the car, as soon as you start bleeding the brakes, that pressure will force the piston out to take up the slack between the pad, pads and the rotor and even less depth will be required for this hole. So 15 sixteenths is going to be very, a very safe number uh, uh, for this assembly. So I'm going to mark 15 sixteenths on my drill bit. And I'll go to the, the outside corner of the web so that I get that full 15 or pretty close to it. All right, there's a good mark. I like that. Now let's wind it up and clear out the first uh, half inch or so will be clearing out the adhesive that cured in there overnight and the, uh, the next uh, uh, three eighths of an inch or so will be drilling uh, into the new plug, the new uh, dowel that was installed. Looks good for that one. Times two. Assuming you're working to a mark on a drill bit rather than uh, c counting the, the marks on the uh, crank on the tailstock, uh, it's a lot faster uh, just to loosen the tailstock, pull it out, clear your chips, and uh, push back in uh, for another go. Uh, let's leave that in there. Slow that down. And take a light touch with the file on these surfaces. Just want to knock burrs off. Here's a worn out piece of 220 or a 180 abrasive cloth. And we should be able to drop that nicely down into this pod and uh, have it bottom out. Yep.
And I can tell by the way it rocks that it is not bottoming out on the pin. It is still clear. The, the, tip, the bottom of the hole is still clear of the tip of the pin. And we gain the thickness of the plate uh, in addition to that. So we're very safe there. Give this one a try. Aha! Same feel. Very good. All right. That wraps it up for this job. I thank you for staying with me, and I hope you'll come visit us here at the shop again.